positive films in the series, such as A Lad and a Lamp, complete with watermelon and other stereotypical gags. For the most part, the films appeal to all ages, but the intended audience today, after all, is children. No, in most cases, I think they're, uh, like all advertisers, trying to guess what the audience might not like. I doubt very much whoever this they is that's done this editing uh, had somebody from the black community, community in to help them. Uh, someone from the NAACP, let's say, uh, who would probably say, that's all right, you know, a black kid's going to meet that on the street anyway. Oh, obvious things, like I said, the white flower all over, suddenly making him a very white little boy or something. Some of those bad jokes and watermelon jokes would, yeah, they could come out because it's not good for young white kids to see that either. Most gang members and their families agree with the critics, including those we interviewed, and most of them had very definite feelings, that this censorship, without regard to content, as imposed by King World Productions, is certainly unjustified. Both Farina and Stymie, two of the gang's strongest characters, reportedly felt that way, and neither experienced any discrimination on the Roach lot, nor did Buckwheat or Pineapple. We were treated, I was treated great, you know. In fact, I didn't even know I was colored on them scenes, in those stages, you know what I mean? Everybody loved me, and like one big family those days. Yeah. It was not done with any derogatory. I mean, this was, to me, was a, was a group of children playing together, both whites and blacks. Uh, there was never any mention. I mean, there he was. He was mingled. It was an integrated show. And, of course, uh, 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 I think that that was a good thing about uh, a lot of movies in those days, but about the gang and for kids, and it said something. And probably a much better role model than television has uh, made of any youngsters on television today. you got to understand, I went to the first integrated school in the world. And that was a Howell Roach private school uh, on their lot. Because uh, there was always a black in the our gang comedies. And we went to school together, we worked together. And uh, the race or anything else never did enter into it. It never entered into it. And of Hal Roach himself? Hal? Oh, the man was colorblind. <laughs> The Hal Roach Studios specialized in short comedies, and Roach and his staff were proud of the feature quality of those 20-minute gems featuring Our Gang, Harold Lloyd, Will Rogers, and later Charlie Chase, Thelma Todd and Zazu Pitts, and of course Laurel and Hardy. They were screened with a newsreel, maybe a cartoon, and the feature. Now the larger film companies like MGM, which was distributing the Our Gang shorts, would engage in block booking. That's where they'd say to theater owners, here's our feature and here's our short. To run one, you must run them both. By the mid-30s, it was costing much more to make a short, so economically it made sense to discontinue them. Roach's people were geared towards short comedies, and our gang was Roach's last series, but also his favorite. So he wasn't ready to give them up. He tried them in the longer general spanky without much luck. He'd be more successful with Captain Fury, Brian Ahern's Adventure Yarn, Laurel and Hardy's Way Out West, and later, One Million B.C., and John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. So to save on cost, he cut them from two reels to one reel. Streamliners, he called them, and they were good. But there wasn't that consistent feature-length block booking leverage. So after a couple of seasons, he sold the series, including cast and crew, to his distributor, MGM, who would continue producing the series while he would retain rights to his existing films. But he also sold the name Our Gang, which is why his films became known as The Little Rascals when he distributed them to television in 1955. In late May of 1938, however, when our gang moved from Hal Roach to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, the magic stayed behind. I'd rather sleep with a bunch of porcupines. There were some nice moments in the last years of the Roach films, and the streamliners directed by Gordon Douglas were fast-paced and entertaining. By the way, what is a porcupine? Oh, you tell him, Buckwheat. Oh, Barky, you tell him. Oh, I don't know. Sing a song! Porky, in particular, had some fun moments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, 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 twelve, eight. 
Alfalfa and Spanky were beginning to show their ages, and a cute face was needed. <laughs> I expected this, but not so soon. Don't go to Junior. That's no place for you. The face belonged to Gary Jasgar, and it never seemed to change. Oh, he's not a bit of double, not much. They, they called me the, uh, the, the young Buster Keaton because I was very deadpan, didn't smile, didn't do anything other than uh, uh, create havoc for all the rest of the gang. Now Mel Jasgar, one time Junior recalls little of his stint with the gang, having been less than two when he made this his first scenes. I was uh, Darla's little brother, and I was sitting on Madeline Carroll's lap, and uh, my very, very first scene, and I don't know, maybe I was nervous, but I wet my pants. And they had to shut down production for three hours until everybody drew, dried out. Uh, they didn't have things like dryers or hair blowers in those days. So uh, from then on, they made my parents buy two sets of costumes for me for every scene so that in case we should have that kind of an accident again, that uh, we'd be able to change and start production again a little bit faster. MGM also featured Darwood Kay as Waldo and Shirley Coates, cast as the plain Jane, was rather insensitively christened Muggsy. Some new characters were introduced during the final years. There was Billy Laughlin, who was froggy, and would become a central character. Does your voice always sound like that? No, sir, only when I talk. <laughs> and Janet Burston replaced Darla Hood, who had graduated as our gang's sweetheart. Mickey Gubatosi joined as the cute tag-along when Porky Lee departed. Spanky remembers young Mickey as... Kind of a whiny kid. He talked whiny. And uh, he was... Uh, he could... Uh, he was the only kid, the only actor that I had ever had anything to do with that could cry on cue. He had that... He had that talent. At two, Mickey performed in New Jersey with his father and sister in an act called The Three Little Hillbillies. At five, he joined the gang, anglicized his name at eight, and later was featured in the Red Rider series as Little Beaver, which he's called the commode of his life. He was a nice, a nice little Italian kid. And uh, that was the one exception of socializing, is that uh, our folks and his folks got along very well, and I got along well with Mickey. Of course, I was much older than he was. And they used to come out to the house all the time when we lived in the valley in Van Nuys. And uh, his mother and dad would come out and cook spaghetti. Bobby Blake is today, of course, Robert Blake, and a much better actor than when he was, as he puts it, a child laborer. Frank and outspoken, he now says he was unhappy as a child. If I hadn't been on a set, he says, I would have been grumpy wherever I was. Matt, don't send them to jail this time. They didn't mean to be naughty. We didn't, honest. If Bobby Blake had anything to be grumpy about, it was scenes like this. Dog, I can see now that that's where we were wrong. If we'd been more careful and learned everything about it, we wouldn't be here, disgraced and in trouble. The MGM pictures became vehicles for moral messages. Gang, the newspaper says the Red Cross needs money. Let's get our pennies together and send them in. It's a very good cause. Now repeat after me. We all promise to stick together. We all promise to stick together. Earlier, we were cleverly offered membership in the secret order of the Winking Eye, the ancient and honorary order of the Woodchucks Club Incorporated, the secret Revengers Club. Now it was one for all and all for one. Now, this is a high sign of brotherhood. And this is a sign of trouble. Now, if you ever see a member do this sign, you gotta help. Because our motto is one for all and all for one. They were still called our gang comedies, but they weren't funny. The charm was gone. The credibility was gone. While MGM made some marvelous musicals in the 40s, the Our Gang films weren't among them. Compared to the Roach-produced Follies films, they were 